Well, hello, friends. Thank you for joining me. It's the Friday edition of the Daily Connection. We're ending our week in Revelation chapter 12. I told you when we started the week, it's going to be a week full of symbolism, imagery. I tell you, I just want to commend Andy. He and I talked about it a little bit. He said, man, Brother Brent, this is, this is going to be tough. And it is tough because we oftentimes view all of Revelation through a futuristic lens but there are some chapters where actually what we're getting from John is kind of a, a culmination of history, if you will, how, how the whole thing has unfolded. And that's what I want you to think about today as we get to chapter 12. I want us to look at verses 1 through 5 and then understand that through the lens of history. All right, here we go. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labor and agony as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven crowns. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that when she did give birth, he might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, a male who was going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So let's stop right there. So here we see what John is. John says he sees a great sign twice. He says in verse 1, says it again in verse 3. Uh, greatness can even you know, refer to either the, the sheer size of the sign or the magnitude in terms of its implications. Now what's fascinating is the imagery we see here is not far into scripture already. Because, like, for instance, the idea of a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars on her head, you know, we understand that some of that could, in fact, be referring to Israel itself, especially the idea of 12 stars. You know, the moon, we go back to the, you know, the, the vision of Joseph. You know, there were aspects of his visions regarding how his brothers would bow to him, but yet his father and mother being represented in that dream in imagery, much like the idea of the sun and the moon. Uh, you know, and so here, most scholars, well, say most scholars believe that what we have here is actually Israel itself. Some see it as being all of God's redeemed people. But here's the thing. If this is a not just if this isn't just a futuristic vision, but it's actually a culmination of history and how it's been worked out, then it really it really fits to see it as Israel, God's chosen people. And then of course when we come to the other sign, I'm going to skip verse two for just a second and come to verse three. It says there was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, seven horns, and on its heads were seven crowns. So here we are given a, basically a picture of Satan himself. Uh, the first time that he's described as a dragon, but it, again, it captures that serpent imagery. Satan, all throughout scripture, is in some cases referred to as a serpent of old. So here's this dragon, the word, you know, the, the color red is perfect for him. Uh, the idea of fiery also as well, but red is perfect because that's the symbolism of, 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 fire, of blood, you know, of judgment, of, of one who's unleashing pain and agony. And so here's Satan in, in basically his truest form. And it says here he had seven heads, seven horns. You know, of course, seven horns might well be referenced to the number of kingdoms that have, have you know, existed in the time uh, preceding the final kingdom that will be ruled by Antichrist. And he says there are crowns there. So there's some authority being granted. There's some authority being given and, and being exercised here. Uh, in terms of the crowns idea. And in those verse 4, its tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. Now, one of the things that's oftentimes seen here is that we've got this struggle taking place, you know, in, in terms of the, the heavenly realm. And in that struggle, Satan was defeated, but he didn't go down alone. Some see the reference to stars here as being referenced to, or in verse 4, as being referenced to angels. And the fact that when Satan was defeated, he didn't go down alone, he didn't fight alone, he actually took a certain, a certain portion of the angels with him, they now are the fallen angels, and in some cases, they're, they're demonic in the way that they're, they function. They're, they, they're characterized with demons. Both, all that together, are the opposition to God's plan of salvation, and, and to God in period. And so, all the way back in Genesis 3, we see Satan identified you know, as, as a serpent, Coming to Eve, speaking, 
misleading them to the point of disobeying God. That brings sin into the picture. And that brings death into the picture. And from that point forward, Satan is trying everything he can to thwart the salvation plan of God. Even in Egypt. You know, in Egypt, Israel goes to Egypt uh, under the uh, careful, you know, under the care and, 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 and uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a provision of, of, of the Pharaoh. Sorry about that, the Pharaoh. But then, eventually, a, a new Pharaoh comes on who's threatened by Egypt, and in that, he threatens the firstborns. That will then threaten the lineage of Messiah that was promised back in Genesis 3. So there's one example of the threats that came to that. And then we fast forward, and in this case, if the idea of the woman giving birth is in fact talking about Messiah, and there's a good reason to believe that it is, we know that Satan was always trying to stop that plan, thwart God's plan of redemption. And you know, now in the Christmas season, we know that one of the ways he did that was through Herod. When after being notified by the wise men years after the, you know, at least maybe a year or two after the birth of Jesus, he unleashed a tirade of death against the Jewish males, something similar to what we see in Egypt in order to make sure there's no king that's going to come through the Jews that's going to threaten his kingdom. And there's one example. And of course, we know the ultimate example was, you know, we know another example was Satan tempting Jesus later on to try to get him to align himself with him, you know, to, to move outside the will of God. Didn't work. We know Satan was a key in trying to, in, in the, the death of Jesus, trying in that way to stop God's plan of salvation. And, but in fact, God sovereignly used that for his salvation, which might be the reference to verse uh, five, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So although Satan tried through death to remove Messiah, it was in death that Christ really became the Messiah. He became the conquering king that he was born to be and that he had prophesied he would be. And so as you look at these verses today, again, the, the symbolism is, is, is very unusual if you take it outside of its context. But if you keep it within the context of Scripture and you actually view it not so much as a futuristic event, but as a, a, a I guess you could say, a summation of, of salvation history, we really then it really begins to make sense that what John is seeing isn't prophetic in what's coming; it's instead a descriptive of what has already taken place, and that this battle that has been waged for thousands of years is about to reach a boiling point. It's about to reach the pinnacle, and God in Christ, God in Christ is going to unleash His final judgment against sin, against Satan, and all of those who have aligned themselves with Him. And it's a reminder to us that as we celebrate our Lord's birth, we are celebrating God continuing to be faithful to his word, Satan continuing to try to come against our Lord and all of his efforts, but the fact that Christ won. We have victory because he indeed overcame. He overcame the temptation. He overcame death. He overcame the, you know, all that we can't, he did. And for that, we celebrate the, our Lord. We celebrate his birth, we celebrate his death, and we anticipate his coming return. It's a reminder, we're on the winning team. If you're a born-again believer, you're on the winning team. Not because you do good things, not because you follow certain religious activities, but because you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone, then that means you're on the winning team. And although we may still deal with persecution, we may still deal with certain aspects of living in a fallen world, like physical ailments, like uh, emotional disappointment, I mean, relational disappointments, all those things, we are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Even Satan himself will ultimately be defeated. And friends, that's something to praise God for. And that's the reason why we get together for worship. We get together to celebrate what God has done in Christ in sealing our salvation we also get together in anticipation of the heavenly celebration that we'll enjoy in our eternal dwelling and in the return of Christ. That's why gathering is so important. I love technology. I love how it allows me to come into your life daily through the daily connection, how it allows us to, to stream our services on Sunday if you're traveling or if you happen to be away. I love that. But that's not what it is to be the church. To be the church is to be gathered. I know we've had so many different theories and so many different uh, styles presented over the years where screens are used and all that, but that can never replace the gathered body. The church was created together. And so I'm, in, I'm just challenging now, as we lead up to Christmas, 
and the celebration. Be physically present in worship if you can. Please come together. 8.30, 9.45 small groups, 11 o'clock worship again. As we continue to celebrate our Lord and the songs of praise that were dedicated to him. This coming week, we're going to talk about the song of Simeon. And that's a song of redemption. It is a beautiful song that recognizes who Jesus is, what he's done, and the implications of that for us and for all who call upon his name. Well, friends, love you. I hope you've had a great week in the Word. And now let's transition that into a great Sunday of celebrating our Lord through the study of his Word and the singing of his praises. Till we're together Sunday, live sent.